Um, I, I I think that we got permission from the the head honcho to say that I am. I, I mean, this is this is a hot off the press thing that. I'm so excited to be one of the keynote speakers for CAGSI's conference this year in beautiful Loveland, Colorado. I just learned where this was about 20 minutes ago because of Google Maps. Um, and there's some stuff there and like the devil's backbone, which is a thing. So I, but I mean, I love all the Colorado people. I love CAGSI in general. So it's, it's a true honor to be there. And I read it, wrote it on my calendar and I'm just start ticking off the days seven months from now when we're all together in person. So if I don't scare you off today, make sure you come up and say hi to me in seven months when we're in beautiful Loveland. Um, still don't really know where that is. Um, so let's talk sensory stuff. So in case you, you know, thank you for the lovely introduction as always, Randy. Um, we're going to talk about sensory processing, sensory processing disorder, talk about the different kinds of neurodivergent brains. Um, we're going to post these slides so you will get them. So don't worry about that part of it. Um, and, you know, if you have questions, please don't hesitate to pay, um, you know, post them online or send them to, um, you know, on the Facebook live. I mean, we'll be sure to answer them. So with all that said, let's dive in. And we're going to dive in with a little exercise. So do me a favor, wherever you are, do your best to get really still and really silent. Take a big, deep breath if you can. And as you do, think about what, what changes in your sensory field. As you get still and silent, what new sensations come to mind? For me, I can hear the hot water heater now. My cat apparently is in the litter box right now because they hear the screech, screech, screech. And I just realized I'm thirsty. So I'm gonna have a sip of my water. The idea here, gang, is that we are bombarded with sensory stuff all day. And from the minute we wake up to the minute we go to sleep, sensory stuff is flying at us all the time. And our brain to keep us sane filters out a lot of it. Right now, you are sitting on a chair or a bench or a bed, or maybe you're pacing around the, an airport lobby. So your body is touching something. You're feeling the clothes that are on your body. There's a temperature in the room. Maybe you're hungry. Maybe you're thirsty. Maybe you have a dry mouth. Maybe you're still fighting off that cold from Christmas, right? Whatever that thing might be. But our bodies quickly acclimate to sensory experiences and then sort of put them in the background. But when we sit and are intentional with that thing, we can change our sensory experience, which is kind of like a superpower, right? So just to show you how much power we have over our sensory experiences, just sitting still for 10 seconds changes the whole thing. So when we were in school, we all learned about the five senses. My kids are in school right now learning this. My daughter is very proud of herself that she knows all of them. Uh, sight, hearing, taste, tactile or touch, and smell. So those are the big five. Now, this may be news to you, but that number five is actually pretty out of date. There are somewhere between nine and 21 senses, and we're going to focus on the most commonly accepted additional four. The first is proprioception. This is your sense of body and space. If you've ever watched American Ninja Warrior, or since we're talking to Colorado people, if you've ever ski jumped, you're using your proprioception because you have to understand where your body is in space. The next we have the vestibular sense. This is our ability to do smooth movement. When you are navigating a crowded room, like at, say like at a wedding or at a conference, you're using your vestibular sense because your ears are balancing you and enabling you to move smoothly through obstacles. When your vestibular sense is off for whatever reason, your movements are much more herky-jerky, right? If you sleep overnight, you might wake up in the morning and be a little staggery, a little zombie-like. That's because your vestibulars have sort of adjusted you being asleep and they need to get moving again once you wake up. It's not just your bad back, which is my excuse. Uh, next, we have thermoception. 
temperature. This is a thing that actually a lot of gifted kids struggle with is thermoception, right? I don't know how hot or cold I am. They're like, well, your, your arm is on fire. Huh, that is new information to me, right? I, I have a joke, like I have the world's best thermostat. I, my internal body temperature does not really change. So I can be, everyone else in the room is really hot. I'm doing okay. And then I re- looked into it. I was like, oh, that's a gifted kid thing. Oh, because we're, you know, you can be either hypersensitive to it or hyposensitive to it like I am. And last but not least, equilibrioception or balance. And if you're wondering about balance, just think about yourself for a second here. If you are putting on shoes or pants or a skirt in the morning, how many times do you have to shoot your other leg down like a piston? <laughs> uh, for me, it was three times this morning, trying to put my shoes on. Um, apparently, I do not have very good equilibrioception. Um, so we, and there are several other, you know, minor senses that we could talk about, but these nine are really important places to start our discussion. Sensory processing is the neurological process that organizes a sensation from your body and from the environment and makes it, impossible, makes it possible to use your body effectively within that environment. So it's a bi-directional process. We're getting information from the outside, information internally, and then the combination of that information allows us to use our body in space. Um, and like we talked about, our brain is constantly taking in sensory information, but we need to figure out how to use it, right? So you might have gone on a three mile hike and at the end of that three miles, you're turning around to head back and you twist your ankle. Now you haven't thought about your ankle for the three miles that you hiked, but now that you've twisted it, it's all you can think about, right? A sprained ankle is like, nope, nothing else exists, right? Um, or like a bee sting is another way to think about it. So sensory processing disorders come when those multi-sensory integration pieces are not adequately pro- processed in order to provide that information to then provide appropriate responses to the environment. So a sensory processing disorder could be something as in, I can't integrate the information, I'm only paying attention to one thing, or I've integrated it so much that it's paralysis by analysis. There's too many things to do. So disorders can take a lot of different uh, directions, which is why treating sensory processing disorder can be such a challenge. But all sensory is- issues are a result of over-processing the input, under-processing the input, or that it's being lost in transit. And one of the things that's really interesting about the gifted brain is that there's some evidence to suggest that the gifted giftedness is actually a learning disability because of how fast information is transferred throughout the brain. When information is transferred that quickly, it doesn't leave a memory trace. And so think about your own kids, right? T- Matthew just says, well, Sally, what's nine times two? Sally goes 18. You're like, how'd you get that? And Sally goes, I don't know. And the teacher goes, oh, you need to show your work because reasons, right? Sally literally doesn't know. She's not being obstinate. Well, she's gifted. She might be being obstinate, but <laughs> there's a decent chance she's not. And sometimes our sensory stuff is it gets lost in transit. It moves too quickly. So all of a sudden you're like, I'm in pain. And we're like, well, what's going on? I don't know, right? Because it happened that quickly. So, you know, as we do an assessment of our own sensory needs, paying attention to what are the things that we over-process? What are the things we attend to way too much? What are things that we under-focus on? And what things sometimes get lost in transit? And when we hit that overload, right? Because that's that's primarily when most of our sensory issues show up. This is a nice little chart that gives us the arousal stress piece of it and what's going to happen to our bodies. Now, as I said, you guys are going to get these slides, so I won't go over it in detail. But I'll tell you this. Since I became a parent, I am much more susceptible to auditory sensory overload because I've got a three, I've got a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old. And they go, bah, 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 and my wife's from the other room going, bah, 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 bah. and I'm like, I, you know, I, I get twitchy, right? And, and it's amazing how quickly that can go from baseline to I'm about to have a meltdown. And I don't mind sharing this with you guys because, you know, I try to be a human person. And it's, 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 you know, when you think about it in terms of your needs, ev- everybody has sensory stuff that gets them there, gets them there quickly. 
a big part of figuring out what happens in your life is to understand what are what are the various situations that send you on this chart? What sends you to overload crisis? For some people, it's strobing lights. You know, even if you don't have an epileptic piece, right? It's just strobing lights is hard for people. Sometimes it's too much garlic. Sometimes, and this actually, I know a teacher who had to leave the profession for this. For some of them, for her, it was a body odor thing. She could not handle body odor. And if you've ever taught or been around a room of high school kids, body odor is a thing. And, you know, and especially for our kids who tend to have poor, weaker ADLs, right? Or maybe have sensory needs around using deodorant or showering, right? I have a kid who's like, yeah, I can't shower, but I can use dry shampoo. That's great, buddy. We need to figure out how to clean the rest of your body because you're only keeping your hair clean. The rest of you is a little bit ripe, right? But she literally had to leave the profession. She couldn't be in rooms like that anymore. So it can be so overloading and overwhelming, it can actually be traumatic. So what we want to do is teach the ability to identify sensory needs and then modulate them. Like, okay, this is a thing that causes me trouble. How do I navigate that situation? And that's what we're going to get into as we go. So here's our sensory processing disorder. It comes across in these three subsections, sensory modulation, which is the um, which is the under or over response, sensory discrimination. We can't tell things apart. Often that's an auditory thing for our learners. They can't tell voices apart or sound cues apart, but it can also be visual. Um, people who can't tell faces apart. You know, when we think about facial recognition, right? It's all, oftentimes it's emotional based, right? So you just like, what face is this person making? What person is this person making? Right. Most kids can tell the difference between that. But if it gets subtler, some kids don't see a difference. They can't, it's not that they can't tell the difference, they can't see it. Um, and you can imagine if someone who has a proprioceptive trouble with discrimination, you don't know where your body is in space, it is very easy to get injured that way. You know, if you're walking, say, through a classroom and there are chairs everywhere. And you cannot discriminate where the chairs are and where the chairs are, you're likely to fall on your face. And last, sensory based motor disorders. And that's where we get into dyspraxia and postural disorders. So I know, you know, I'm currently working with a client who, who's dyspraxic. Um, and, you know, we're working with a really great occupational therapist, but I had never really seen this laid out this way. But it's really it's a fascinating thing to watch the neurological aspect of this play out in a gifted learner. First line of defense, well, is sensory therapy. We're going to, it's driven by four main principles. The idea is just right challenge. If you've heard me talk before, you know, I often talk about the leading edge of learning, meeting your kid where they are. So the child must be able to meet the successfully meet the challenges presented through their playful activities. And we were going to adapt those to wherever the kid is. We need to teach adaptive responses. We need to have new and useful strategies in response to the challenges presented. So if traditionally your kid can't handle, say, a train going through town with a big train horn, and they've dealt with that by slamming doors or ripping paintings off walls, now we want them to put on their headphones, right? That's an adaptive response. Active engagement, we want to engage kids with sensory stuff because, and I'm going to return to this point a lot, but so much of our messaging around sensory stuff is negative. These sensory things hurt, are painful, are unpleasant, uncomfortable. But sensory stuff can be fun and motivating. You know, you know, think about your favorite dinner or a good glass of wine or the way the air feels on like a really crisp winter day, right? Like those are all positive sensory experiences. So we want our sensory training, our sensory therapy to evoke those fun and desirable things. And then child directed, like all good, like a lot of good approaches we take the kid's interests and desires in mind and we follow the kid in that direction. Largely speaking, you're gonna have kids who are sensory seeking versus sensory avoiding. Um, my, you know, I'm cer certainly a sensory seeker. Um, you know, I, I'm, you'll find me, I'm usually chewing on gum or a gobstop or a cough drop. I usually am drinking something. I'm often like sort of like fiddling with my hands. You know, you'll see me sometimes just like spinning a pen around my finger. This is seeking sensory stuff. If you have a kid who bit, who eats late at night or, you know, sometimes overeats or overdrinks, 
they're probably craving some sorts of sensory stimulation. And the only way they know how to get it is through a lot of food. You also can have a kid who's sensory avoiding, right? And that's the thing. It's like, I am aware of what the things are and I will do whatever is in my power to get out of that situation. You know, uh, one of my, I posted this on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. You know, somebody posted, uh, somebody shared to me, it's like, were you a no socks or shoes ever neurodivergent kid? Or you, uh, I have to wear socks and shoes neurodivergent kid. Now I was a no socks or shoes. I grew up on the beach. So it's like, why, why would you wear shoes? Why would you wear shoes ever? And now I'm a dad and I'm like, well, if I don't, I mean, why would I not wear my shoes? My shoes keep my feet safe and warm. So, you know, these things kind of evolve and change as you go. All right. So Randy, do you mind doing me a favor? Helping me, helping me out with something? Sure. Excellent. So we're going to do two quick sensory exercises and they're going to demonstrate to people the power, power of the sensory parts of our brain. All right. So Randy, I want you to think of a bowl. Can you think of a bowl? Mm -hmm. What color is it? White. Excellent. How big is the bowl? Uh, about like six inches in diameter. Nice, nice. Very good. What would you like to eat from that bowl? Well, I immediately thought cereal. Right. What kind of cereal? This is important. I haven't had Captain Crunch in a really long time. And Remind it sounds good initially yeah. remind me later i will give you my um my recipe for uh captain crunch roll-ups they are an awesome little dessert um they're really really yummy okay uh, okay so you finish your captain crunch you drank the milk your bowl's right there and then your kiddo comes over and says look mommy and takes a fork and goes to the bottom of the bowl what did <laughs> what's going through your head right now Oh, nails on a chalkboard. He's going to scrape that fork over the bottom of the empty bowl and it's going to sound absolutely terrible. Absolutely terrible. And to, to our friends on the live, right? Like, I, I think you're having a similar sensory experience. Now, this is the amazing thing, right? There is no bowl. There is no fork. There is no child. I mean, obviously you have children, but like there, nobody's here with us. But even talking about this experience, sent chills down your spines, right? Our, our, now, like, because the sensory stuff can be so unpleasant, our bodies will go to great lengths to avoid it, even if it's only up here. Mm -hmm. right? So imagine what that's like for a kiddo wondering about the smell of the locker room for gym class in two periods. It's it, the, just the idea of it can be enough to be redirected. Now let's go the other direction. Randy, uh, refresh my memory. What's the town you live in? Fort Morgan. Okay. What's the best pizza place in Fort Morgan? I mean, we have chains. Okay. And I I tend to lean towards Papa Murphy's because by the time I get at home, it's cold. Right. And that's tough, right? Yeah. So let's re let's reframe that question. What's the best pizza you've ever had? Oh. So if you if you live in Colorado and you know about the town of Greeley, there's a pizza place called Fontas Pizza. And it's been open since my dad was a teenager. He went on his first date with my mom there. And it's like this old Greek guy. He, was, he passed away, but his family still runs it. And it's like the best crispy, thin crust, gooey, cheesy pizza. It's delicious. I crave it all the time. That's awesome. All right. So we're going to go there in our minds. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's a Fontana. Did I get that right? Fontas. Fontas. Okay. Fontas. You pull up in your car and there's Fontas. And you open the door. What's as soon as you walk into the restaurant? What's the first thing you smell? Garlic, oregano, and marinara sauce. Mm -hmm. And then you know, there's like, oh, your pizza will be ready in just one second. Now, do me a favor, check in, check in with yourself. Is your mouth watering right now? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely right. Mine is too, and I've never eaten Fanta's pizza. Right? <laughs> I, I love doing this exercise here on the East Coast because every oh, small yeah. town in Jersey, New York, Connecticut has their pizza place. And then people get all angry at the comments. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. But, I, I don't get to my car with the pizza. That first piece is in my mouth before I even get in the car. <laughs> long distance high five. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and if you did this exercise along with us, fr friends on the Facebook Live, that's the idea. It's like 
just by calling images or memories or future events to mind, our bodies give us a sensory experience. My mouth is watering right now for a pizza I've never had in my life. Now, granted, I love, I've body by pizza, let's be real. But like, it's a, you know, it's a way to just sort of map on that thing. And remembering our brain's power to do this can be a secret tool in your toolbox for helping your kids through sensory moments. If you can call to mind a positive sensory experience, it can really sort of arrest a problematic moment. So here's a great thing on sensory processing disorder. Um, I, I included this originally because I actually have the shorts that this <laughs> cartoon character has, uh, but we'll let you guys read this on your own. You, you know, if you've heard me talk about this before, giftedness is a distinct neurological profile, which is why it has a seat at the table for neurodiversity. Um, we can go through all the various parts. I'm going to highlight a few things here. One is the prefrontal cortex right here. That's our executive functioning center of our brain. Now we know in gifted learners and twice exceptional kids that the prefrontal cortex is weaker. Uh, it comes online later in life which means we're much more likely to make mistakes. We're much more likely to struggle to inhibit behavior. And what that ends up looking like is the I-25 interchange when you're trying to leave Denver at rush hour. Did I get that right, I-25? That's what I'm talking about. So it's not that we want to make mistakes, but there's just so much information coming to one part of the brain that is already under-equipped to handle that problem. It quickly becomes a train wreck. So we have all these cars crammed together, accidents have occurred. So imagine your gifted kid, you're sitting there in class, you're trying to learn, you're also paying attention to your peers. The room is a certain temperature, there are certain smells and sounds, and all that stuff is whipping through your brain and trying to be sorted out by this part of, by the prefrontal cortex. You could see how adding even an, a little bit more stress to that situation might lead to a meltdown because there's just only so much bandwidth that part of the brain can handle. You know, one of the blessings or curses of the gifted brain is a more interconnected limbic system. The limbic system is the emotional systems of our brain, and it's more interconnected with other parts of the brain. Uh, you know, famously, um, Johns Hopkins did a study where they asked 100 neurotypical kids and 100 gifted kids to name all 50 state capitals. Now, there's a certain baseline anxiety of that because it's a demand task. But what they found is the neurotypical kids have X amount of anxiety, as they could see on the brain scans. But when the gifted kids did, their whole brains lit up because the, ex the emotional experience in the gifted brain is it's just a more pervasive global thing. We feel more feelings uh, because we have more connections. This thing is more wired and we have larger amygdalae which is the source of fight or flight emotions in our brain. And then the parietal lobe. So that's right on top of your head here. Um, the parietal lobe integrates sensory information across the brain. It gives us our spatial sense of navigation. There's the proprioception again. Um, and the Latin term for this is the homunculus, the little man, which I just think is very cute. Um, it also gives us the idea of mechanoreception. So temp uh, temporoception is a subset of this. So our skin, the largest organ in our body, its primary job is to give us sensory input from the environments around us, right? If you think about um, the character from uh, Mean Girls, you know, there's a 20% chance it's already raining. You know, she knows that because her skin is getting wet because she's standing in the rain. I'm not going to do the bit. It would be weird. Um, right. But the idea here is that there's all these nerve endings in our skin that are all being processed in the parietal lobe. So that information has got to be sorted, figured out what's important, and then sent to the prefrontal cortex for the subsequent behavior. There's a lot of opportunities for there something to go wrong. And the parietal lobe is also responsible for a lot of language processing. So we see this as a, a source of many learning disabilities, such as apraxia, dyslexia, dyscalculia, and agnosia. Now, this becomes really interesting because you could see how a, a subfunctional parietal lobe would load into a 2E profile, right? So now you're a dyslexic gifted kid, 
And we know the parietal lobe, given the interconnectivity, is more likely to have sensory processing issues as well. So now you've got a kid, gifted IQ, dyslexia, plus sensory processing stuff. So, I mean, that same part of the brain can load in in a couple different directions. And here's a nice map of our, of our um, little man. You know, like a lot of pieces of the brain, the brain is contralateral. So the left part of your brain handles the right part of your body and the right part of your brain handles the left part of your body. Um, and this just sort of lays out what the different parts of the parietal lobe are responsible for. Um, from your lips, teeth, and tongues, and gums, to your genitals and everything in between. So one of the things we know about gifted and neurodivergent kids is they tend to have asynchronous development. Asynchronous development is when things do not hold together in terms of develop, development. So you'll have a neurotypical 10 year old who's basically 10 socially, emotionally, physically, academically, intellectually, basically a 10 year old. A neurodivergent kiddo, like a gifted or a 2E kid, is going to have their development like this graph shows us all over the place. And one of the things we know about this is that so much energy goes to the PFIT. This is the parietal lobe again and the frontal lobe where they intersect. That's where intelligence is in the brain. So much energy goes to developing that part of the brain that other things lag behind, most of which is our emotional control center. But also in terms of for sensory processing, our psychomotor or physical skills. One of my all-time favorite gifts. <laughs> I'm trying, right? So psychomotor skills often develop differently in neurodivergent kids. So when you, when you struggle to process vestibular and proprietal sense of stimuli, it often shows up as fine motor problems, awkwardness in running, poor posture, weaker core body strength, and vitally differences in fine motor. So quick show of hands, Facebook. How many of you or your kids have ever been dinged for having poor handwriting? Right. And I remember when I when I started my web comic, you know, because I'm a cartoonist, I worked so hard to have good handwriting to make it very clear and legible. It took forever. It was like so hard to learn, right? But handwriting is a fine motor skill. This stuff becomes important, not only psychologically, right? Because this is going to have impact on how we feel about ourselves and our skill set, but also, also socially. Because think about the things that matter to a kid's peers when they are in grammar school, elementary school, middle school. Art, music, sports. And if you don't have those skills or, the, or those things are lagging because of asynchronous development, you know, I cannot tell you how many kids of mine I've watched on the soccer field or on the frisbee field. And it's just like, it looks like they're running in jello, right? It's just their bodies are not responding in the same way. And given the outsized level of importance of sports in our society, and I hope the Denver Broncos find a coach very soon, um, those things matter and we can't pretend that they don't, right? So giving kids intentional practice to overcome these fine motor delays are going to help them not only psychologically, but also socially. And, there, and that matters. And then we could go through all of the overexcitabilities, but I wanted to sort of cut to the, the core here. So one of the five core overexcitabilities from Dabrowski is a sensory overexcitability, the heightened experience of sensory pleasure or displeasure from sensory input smell, taste, touch, et cetera. Now, many gifted kids are easily overwhelmed and distracted by sensory input, right? They, they you know, I can't learn today because the, the tag on my shirt is too itchy. Most, many people would be able to say, oh, my tag is itchy. All right, I'm good. All right, and then they just go on with their lives. People with sensory it challenges, especially if you're sensory overexcitability, it's like, oh no. Oh no, I can't do anything until I get my socks the right direction. Or I can't do anything until I I use a floss to figure out what's in my teeth right here because I can feel it, right? This is where that sensory seeker or sensory avoider comes in. 
Because if the brain is seeking that sensory experience to self-regulate, then your kid is going to answer every question, stand on the desk, you know, touch, touch, feel, feel, talk, talk, word, word, rub, rub. They're seeking, seeking that. The sensory avoider will be like, I can't answer questions. I'm just going to sink down in my chair, right? Because they're trying to avoid that because it's too stimulating. So we're going to go through, go through this more, but when you start this process for yourself or your kiddos, do an assessment. What sensory areas are overstimulating? Right For me, if both of my kids are screaming at me at the same time and then my wife starts talking to me, it's very quickly like cartoon, right? And then what sensory inputs give pleasure? You know, I there are a few things I like more than whipped cream. I like the taste of whipped cream. I like the I like the texture of it. I like the sound it makes when it comes. Right, whipped cream is a sensory pleasurably th pleasurable thing for me. Right, that's wonderful. And now whipped cream may not be your cup of tea. Doesn't have to be, but everybody's got that. I was doing this talk once, and somebody goes, "You know that sound that like a crispy Cheeto makes?" And you go, "I'm like, I have had crispy Cheetos. I I don't know the particular. He's like, that's my sound." That's my sound. And when I left the thing, he was he was in the he was in the lobby in, at the uh, snack machine getting a thing of crispy Cheetos. I was like, my man, seek out your sensory goodness, right? We usually start these conversations with clothes and food, thinking about thinking about shoes, thinking about shirts, right? I could be wearing a tie right now, but sensory, I don't really like to wear ties. So if I don't have to, I try not to. Um and then, you know, for people who wear bras, I'll tell you this, if you're going to spend the money, you might as well spend the money to get the proper fitting, because I'll tell you this, my wife just did that. And it's like, it's just such a game changer. It's like everything fits and feels better. You don't have the underwire like up in there, right? Or you don't feel like you don't have any support. And listen, as a cisgender man, I don't, I can't really load into these personal experiences. But having had these conversations with many of my clients over the years, that's an area of something that it's like a rock in your shoe. If it's wrong, it may not make, make you melt down right away, but God, by the end of the day, it's like, I'm ready to punch, punch through a wall here, right? You know, and then yes, you don't have the, you know, like you come home and you're like, Fling! right? Just like I do that with my tie, Fling! right? But wouldn't you rather not have the sensory trauma all day? And then bathrooms, oh, bathrooms. Bathrooms are a sensory nightmare because they're loud, they're bright, they're smelly, they're wet. Why are they always wet? I don't know, especially public bathrooms. I'm assuming the bathrooms in your homes are nice, but you know, so if you're at, if you go to, um, I, is it Ball Arena? That's where the Nuggets and the Abs play now. Right? If you go to Ball Arena and you have to share a bathroom with two, 310 of your closest friends, many of whom have been drinking since noon, that's going to be a sensorily really challenging experience. So there are several apps you can download that tell you where restrooms are and tell you where the family restrooms or the private restrooms or the handicapped accessible restrooms are. And I often tell my gifted, my neurodivergent clients, like, listen, use those. I can't make it not suck for you, but I can make it suck less. That's a simple way to put less pressure on yourself. So <laughs> congratulations, you have sensory processing disorder and it comes with a side of anxiety, right? Because our brain's number one job is to keep us safe. Our brain's job is to keep us alive. And given that we are always taking in sensory information, any disruptions to that process are gonna make us anxious. Cause everybody's like, I don't know what's going on, but I don't like it, right? Where's the threat? Where's the challenge? Where's the problem? right? So our anxiety level rises, which means that whatever resilience we woke up with that morning is just sort of just fading, right? Because our body is not only trying to get us through the day, but also monitoring for threats. So this is where a lot of times good therapy will help with sensory processing, processing disorders, even if it doesn't directly address the SPD. Because if I teach you how to regulate your anxiety better, then you're going to, when your sensory processing problems flare, you're going to be able to self-regulate more effectively. So even if you can't get in with a good OT and you can get therapy, 
talk about your sensory needs and talk about the anxiety that comes with it because we can handle it on the back door if we can't handle it on the front. Also, I just love her face in this last panel. It just makes me so happy. So supporting sensory needs at school. Now we could do an entire presentation on this. I wanted to anchor it to one slide. Flexible seating, I will die on the hill of flexible seating. Give kids the bouncy chairs, give kids the ability to walk around the classroom, you know, give kids the ability to sit on the ground. I, I, I literally don't care, right? As long as they are learning and they need to move their bodies, let them do it. Chair bands, I love a good chair band. They're $8.99 on Amazon right now. You know, just something for kids to push their feet against or even play with the, with their hands, but just a way to give that resistance because there's something about pushing resistance that is very sensorily satisfying to the body, right? So, you know, figure out how to get that in there and, you know, fidget toys, they get a bad rep. I get it. However, when they work well, they're a godsend. And I would tell you, don't let the comments in the various mom Facebook groups scare you off because a good fidget toy can be a, a, a huge blessing. When I was um, when I was in school, I, uh, I had a half dollar that I used to spin over my fingers all the time. And I tell you, I took better notes. I retained more information. And finally, the, the math, this was in college, I was like, you know, I don't, I don't like that coin, Mr. Zakreski. And I was like, yeah, but it helps me learn. And he goes, how does it help you learn? I'm like, I don't actually know, sir, but I know I take better notes and I'm more focused when I have it. Like, you only need to get documentation from the Office of Disabilities. I was like, that's what it takes, sir. I got a nice little letter from them. Mr. Zagreski can use his coin, right? But, you know, document, right? Even if your kid doesn't have a fi formal 504 plan, get it in writing. Allow them to have their Rubik's cube, their fidget toy, their their spinner, their clicky ball, their their uh, the popums, whatever works for your kiddo. That's a nice segue into what I like to call the board bag. So you can hang the bag on the back of the kid's desk, and it's got a bag full of preferred options. So you don't need to reinvent the wheel every time the kid has a sensory need. There's a bag of stuff there. So if they like the the you know crazy Aaron's fidget putty, or a Sudoku or a book or rubber bands, right? Just have that stuff in the bag. So the kid, if they have downtime, if they finish something early, they can reach into the bag and get a thing that's gonna redirect that sensory energy in a positive direction. Not like I'm gonna sit here until I melt down or flip, flip a desk. Give kids an access to a preferred sensory space if needed. For a lot of kiddos, that's the library, right? especially if you're more of a sensory avoider. However, you're a sensory seeker. I have a kid who's allowed to go sit in the gym and watch gym class when he has the sensory needs because he just he just pulls up a chair and watches the volleyball, right? And that's something that's a very sensory loud environment, but he likes that. Adapt schedule and plans for sensory challenge classes. Research shows that it tends to be these four things. Lunch, dysregulated, unstructured time filled with smells and people and talking, lots of mm, art class because maybe it's a textual thing for the clay or the paint. Maybe it's the smell of the glue. Um, gifted kids can struggle with art stuff anyway, but if there's a sensory component to it, we want to take that into effect. Music, I mean, I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and gym, you know, I think more and more we're seeing schools move to more flexible gym environments. Kids who can do gym at home, do gym virtually, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of online programs for that now. Out school will track your your attendance and engagement and then create a report for you to email to your school. That's just for a lot of our kids. It's just smarter. I have a kid that we successfully told the school during gym, can he do a couple laps around the building playing Pokemon Go? Because Pokemon Go tells you how many steps you took. And they're like, yeah, that's great. He walks three kilometers a day doing Pokemon Go. His legs look like the rock. It's unbelievable. Like, you know, you could break a walnut with his with his thighs. It's, un, you know, but that's the thing. That's an accommodation we made because the locker room for him, not only because of his social anxiety, but the smells, the textures, he, you know, having to put deodorant back on. It was just, it was a lot for him. Everybody's happier now. Fire drills. God help me with fire drills. I mean, it is, it is, case law from the Americans with Disabilities Act 
that your child is entitled to know when a fire drill is coming. That's there's actual case law on this. This can be written into a 504 or an IEP, but they'll say, hey, Sally, there'll be a fire drill at noon today. We will have you exit the building earlier with XYZ staff because it's not about the panicky part. It's about the leaving the building part, right? When I worked at a school for gifted kids, Every fire drill, we had a few more kids who came out early. And you know who it hurt? Nobody, right? And sometimes the parents are like, oh, but if it was an actual emergency, well, if it was an actual emergency, we would be doing things a different way. The idea is giving kids the reps in the safest possible way. And then smartphones. I mean, you know, we live in a smartphone age, helping kids understand if they are getting their sensory needs met from a cell phone or getting their social anxiety needs met from that. Smartphones can be a tool and we should use them. I love the Headspace app on my smartphone. It's a great way you touch the screen and you trace the bubble around. And it's a great way to center yourself if you're feeling dysregulated. So that's a tool, right? I would use that app. But also if your kid is just playing playing um, Minecraft on their phone to avoid class, less of a problem. So we need to be smart about the apps that are available to our kids. Sensory needs at home. I used to start the conversation with food. What are their preferred foods? What are their non-preferred foods? There are times you might need to challenge that, but I think when in doubt, accommodate. And if you don't want to make a completely separate dinner for your kiddos, it is totally appropriate to have your kids make a peanut butter and jelly, put some chicken nuggets in the toaster, boil a thing of pasta. Like these, these are life skills but it also takes ownership of their own stuff. So, you know, if your kid's like, I'm a buttered noodles person, give me some buttered noodles. It's gotta be the Kerrygold butter. God help you if it's the other kind of butter, right? You can buy the Kerrygold butter, buy the noodles and say, okay, we're all having pot roast. You can make your buttered noodles. That's not mean, that's accommodating. Start with the conversation of sensory experiences and items that are preferred, having those things around, you know, if it's a if it's a Tootsie Roll pop, if it's a favorite hoodie, if it's if it's the you know the backpack that fits just right, the shin guards or the hockey guards that fit just right, understand what those are. Make sure they're in an important place because the day you need them is the day you won't be able to find them. God bless noise canceling headphones; they are my most favorite thing. Having a go bag, um, emergency clothes, snacks, activities, because. If you are out and about and your kid has sensory needs, and let's just say you're walking through downtown Denver, car drives by, giant wave of mud, hits your kid, your kid is drenched. Sensory needs, immediate red line, right? Hey, we've got a go bag in the car, right? It's got preferred clothes, you know, they're dry. We can we can get rid of this because this is where we get into the challenge because a neurotypical person, and that's most people, would be able to overcome that. And I'd be grumpy. They might be bummed out about it. But, you know, they dip into the bathroom. They take a paper towel. They're like, whatever, I'm fine. If your kid has sensory needs, we have temperature stuff, slimy, wet, cold. Ugh. We can't ask kids to do things they can't do. Having a go bag in the car goes a long way. Um, lighting, temperature, background noise. You cannot. You may not be able to control that in your entire house but have a room where that stuff can be controlled. Often it's your kid's room, but it could be the playroom. It could be you know an, an office, right? Wherever those things can be controlled, make sure you have that, set, that room set aside and your kid has access to it and knows how to use the controls. That's why if things like you're having a party at home and your kid starts to get distracted, hey, great time to go to your room, drop the lights, put on the blue mood lighting, get your, get your brown noise machine, and we're just gonna zen for a minute. Setting into that end, setting expectations for visitors, right? If your kid is going to melt down with two hours of sustained social contact, say like, it's not rude that my kid has been in their room for the last 45 minutes because they're, they're recharging, they're recharging the sensory batteries. And, you know, if you don't want the eye rolls and the grumbled under the bed stuff from your, from your in-laws, set expectations when they get there. My kid has sensory needs. So they're going to dip out for a little while. They'll be back for dinner. And yes, for dinner, they're going to have chicken nuggets because they don't need to eat the pot roast. They're going to just have the chicken nuggets. Laundry day. If you're like me and you struggle with the executive functioning pieces of laundry day, 
it's like, oh God, my sheets, it's 10 p.m. And I, my sheets are not dry. So just this sort of thing. I'm not gonna tell you how to spend your money, but make sure you have an extra set of sheets, right? If your kid has a particular brand of undershirts, underwear, bras, hoodies, leggings that they prefer, try to make it so you're not washing all of them at the same time. These are little things, right? Ounce of prevention, pound of cure, all that good stuff. And then when, how much to clean? You know, sometimes we ask kids to clean and that can be sensory really disruptive. So I find it really helpful to say, I want you to take ownership of this thing. What in this house feels safest to you to clean? I can do the dishes. Great, do the dishes. If that's not gonna be a sensory thing for you, I want you to do the dishes. If cleaning your room is gonna be a sensory problem, I'm gonna build up to that over time, right? I, I have a kid I work with who would love nothing more than to do the laundry, but the noise of the dryer drives him crazy. He can't handle it. So we have him do other stuff and we will get him there at some point, right? And then in the community, we don't leave, our sensory issues don't leave us when we go outside. So it's important to set expectations with your kid before you go. Take a five minute check-in, plans, expectations, set a time frame, and bring your resources with you. Bring your board bag, bring a smartphone, bring the noise canceling headphones. It's better to have them and not need them than need them and not have them. Bathrooms, we've had that discussion. And then here's the biggest thing, just because it works for other kids. Some kids can do it, some kids can't. Your kid might do it on Tuesday and fail at it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It, you know, it's easy to get into the mindset here of negative comparison to other kids. And your kids are not their kids. If your kiddo needs the really tight sleeveless hoodie to make it through a trip to the mall, then they wear that. And if they look a little silly, well, those aren't your people. I have learned this with my own children, and I will tell, share this with you. It's better to leave too early than too late because, you know, it falls off a cliff. I think we've all been there. I'm seeing a nodding head, right? Like, you know, it's sort of thing like, okay, we've been here for four hours. Let's leave now. Like, oh, the party's in there for another half hour. Yeah, but the ending of parties is sensory really challenging. The lights come on. Everybody's milling around. It's very unstructured. You're trying to find your coat. That can all of a sudden, it's, and then it's, you couple that with the disappointment and being tired. Well, to that end, smaller and shorter events can be better. This is a tricky thing, especially on birthdays, holiday parties, you know, but if your kid can't handle a 30 person birthday party at Jump Zone because it's sensory, it's just not going to happen. Make sure they go and have burgers or go see a movie with the birthday kid, right? That, you know, or engage in that thing to the extent to which they can, right? It's totally appropriate to not go to the 30 person slumber party, but have that same, the host over for a sleepover the next weekend. We want to set our kids up for success. That might mean starting smaller. And then this is vital. Reward yourselves when the trip is over. This is hard. We are preparing ourselves. We're working hard. I know you're anxious. I can feel your anxiety for taking your sensory need kids into the community. So when you're done, you say, hey, you did a great job, Jill. Here's a cookie. I got a cookie. High five. We did great. Right? Sensory good things. They're going to reinforce all the good stuff you did. Lots of additional resources here. Some articles. Um, really nice article here about how to keep kids from overtiring their eyes, which seems to be linked to a lot of behavioral and academic challenges. Um, some really good books. Um, you know, really like too sticky, even though it's directed to kids with autism, I think it really makes sense for all neurodivergent kids um, because it gets to this idea of like, everybody knows sticky, right? But like, what is too sticky? And, you know, we have some more, the formal academic research part of this, but here's how you track me down. Um, and then, you know, this little cartoon, I think gets to the heart of this. Mother, I am tired, told, hungry, cranky, and my shirt itches. Do you think I will actually learn anything today? And that's like, that's what our kids are asking for, right? I mean, there's not a reason not to go to school, but it's a reason to be intentional about how we approach this. So and then we covered a lot of ground very quickly. As always, you guys were amazing. So give yourselves a big round of applause wherever you might be. You too, Randy. Yes. Um, so. Awesome. 
Yeah, I was so, it's so funny. I was like thinking about, I've had so many students with the emotional support hoodie. Yep. The same yep. every day. Mm-hmm. And, and the parents are always like, I need to wash it. Like I, I need to wash it, <laughs> but I need, there needs to be something to replace it. So usually that's like at home, it's like a blanket or something that they, they replace it with. But uh, I think that's a, that's like a regulation thing, right? Like when everything else seems, you know, it, which is why the hoods up in school rule kind of is for those kids, it's a challenge because sometimes putting that hood up is how they like regulate sensory overload. Yeah. You know, I've seen that with so many students. So that was, that was something that kind of came to mind um, when you were talking is like that with, especially with our teens, yeah. I think that's probably one of the number one things other than the headphones that I see a lot. And leading into that, because I did have somebody ask questions about teens, Cheryl Davenport, um, she asked, um, can Dr. Matt comment on possible changes of sensory overload in the teen years, like sensory needs and puberty? Oh, right. So we go through our five overexcitabilities, right? Sensory, intellectual, psychomotor, emotional, and imaginational. During pro- puberty, sensory, emotional, and imaginational skyrocket. And what that is, is like, you know, what do teens do? They tend to seek sensory experiences. Those sensory experiences could be going to a party. They could be, you know, something of a sexual or romantic nature. They could be binge eating food at two in the morning, right? Teens tend to crave sensory stimulation. So it, it's totally a common and appropriate for you to see those shifts in the teen years, especially as the kids' peers start doing similar things. So then it's going to get reinforced as well. So making more space, giving your kid a longer time in the shower, regardless of what's going on there. We're not there to ask what's going on there. We just know they might need longer in the shower, mm-hmm. right? That's a thing, right? So, you know, like, hey, Instead of showering 10 minutes before we go, let's shower a half hour before we go. Cause that way we've got a little extra time. Um, you know, and obviously teen years are also when you're going to start having more dances, more parties, you have different kinds of clothes to wear different kinds of things, you know? So if you're somebody who, hey, there's a, a young woman I work with who has a sensory issue around dresses. So we got her a kick-ass pair of slacks and a really nice top to wear to, to wear to the winter formal. Like she looks great. She looks fabulous, right? It's not the one shoulder dress that everybody else is wearing, but she's like, I can wear a real bra with this, Dr. Madam. <laughs> right? And everybody laughs because it's like, yeah, strapless bras are terrible. That, that's what they tell me. I don't actually know, but. Yeah, and dances are really hard for some kids. Oh God, right. I mean, dark, loud, sweaty, plus the social stuff. Woo. Yeah. Yeah. And then, you know, uh, Summer Ellen kind of pe- compounded, she actually kind of tagged onto that question. She said, is it known how hormones relate to sensory processing regulation? I'm probably going to be TMI, but there are certain times within the month in which my sensory issues are, are massively heightened. It's like my irritability goes up, but it tends to be in relation to sensory issues. And I will change clothes five times before I walk out of the house because I need to find what's comfortable for me. And if I'm not comfortable, I'm not going to be able to function. Um, and so it, it kind of makes me think like that the puberty hormones, but like our other like hormone movements that we see, particularly in girls, but boys have it too. Do we see those processing sensory processing spike during those times? Yeah. And, and that totally true. And I thank you for bringing up that it's kids of all genders and, you know, in all biological, you know, predispositions are, are, are are subject to hormonal shifts throughout the month. And those can be impacted by the people we're spending time with. They can be impacted by the activities we're doing. I mean, we have seen, there's there have been studies that show that dancers have completely different hormonal cycles when they are in dance season versus not in dance season. Yeah. Right, because of the physical demands on their bodies, right? And we can extrapolate that out to if your kid is a field hockey player or a hockey player or does LARPing. Right. I mean, in season versus out of season, you're going to see different things. So, you know, the only, I don't have a cure for this, but I do, I mean, it comes down to open and honest communication. And what I tell a lot of parents is like, listen, 
these conversations might not be easy for you. They might not be fun, but own it. Like, listen, yeah, I'm super uncomfortable around this, but I'll tell you this. It must be a pretty important conversation if I'm this uncomfortable and I'm still having it with you. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, and you know, gifted kids crave authenticity, right? Like, yeah, you know, I, this is not a conversation I'd like to have, but I also know it's really important. So I'm going to grit my teeth and deal. I hope you can do the same. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, it's kind of along the lines of like having those conversations, but also that preparation piece you talked about, there was a whole side conversation going on about preferred foods. And then somebody said, well, I like to call them safe foods. And I've had a lot of people, some, several people in my family who have uh, processing disorders around food, particularly, and um, kind of the discussion about like going someplace and not have, there's been no safe foods there for them. So they just don't eat. And that, I mean, over the more times you're forced into those social situations, the more anxiety you can have around those situations. So, I mean, obviously my obvious suggestion would be having a snack bag all the time. And I take snacks everywhere I go, just because if I get hungry, I get cranky. But how have you supported your clients who have um, food sensory issues? And, and what are some suggestions that you would provide? Yeah, I mean, and and to the person who, who brought up safe foods versus preferred foods, I see that a lot in the literature. Um, and I, I, I love it. I honor it. I chose to use preferred because to me, like, and this is, this is my bias, right? I like preferred because it's like, it, to me, it gives a little bit more open for growth and pushing the boundaries there. Safe feels a little like, it feels a little different to me, but I I'm cool with either way. Um, one thing is to be, to be thoughtful about what restaurants you go to. And if you're at a wedding, right. And something where the food options are limited. You know, first off, you know, as my boss used to tell me, no's are free. They asked like, listen, my kid only eats butter noodles. Can you give me some butter noodles? They can't. Okay. Then we're going to bring something in. And the vast majority of time, you know, people might roll their eyes or they might complain, but no one is going to kick you out of a wedding or a conference or a fancy dinner for bringing some cereal bars that your kids can eat. Right. And the fact of the matter is most of the time places are pretty accommodating, especially in this day and age where there are much more dietary and allergic restrictions than there ever have been before. You know, I mean, I, we were out to a, my brother-in-law's keto. We were out to a place the other day. He's like, Hey, instead of French fries, can I get some chicharron? And the guy was like, yeah, I'll make some in the house. 10 minutes later, he brings out a thing of house made chicharron instead of French fries. Cause of, for some reason, potato bad, Fr fried pig good i don't <laughs> really understand how he gets away with this right but he's lost 30 pounds so it's like I... mm -hmm. <laughs> right, so like yeah you might as well ask right awesome um so yeah i think the, those were the two big kind of um side discussions that were happening and, and i a couple of people commented on how they like the um boredom list or boredom bag for like the what do we do when we're done question um and that's, you know, that's always a thing for gifted kids, but sometimes, you know, they, they don't want another worksheet, but they also kind of just want to indulge in what their distraction is, that their, their preferred distraction, the drawing or the sketching or the coloring book or the, the Rubik's cube or whatever. Um, so that was kind of appreciated. I think having that boredom bag, um, there weren't really any other questions. I think you were pretty comprehensive and I, I, I personally, I tried to be. <laughs> So, so, um, folks, they, we are a little over time, but that's fine. Cause we love talking to Dr. Matt. Um, we will have, I think Dr. Matt, you're going to share the slides. Yep. Okay. So Dr. Matt's going to share the slides. Those will be linked as a PDF available for you on our Colorado gifted.org website under resources, but we also have recorded this session. So you can rewatch it if you miss the beginning or miss the end um, or miss the middle, um, it is available for you for rewatch as well as access to the slides and um, check out his his links here. So, okay. and also uh, look forward, it's, it's still like what seems like a really long way away, but I'm sure it'll be here before we blink. October 8th through 10th, Tag Tea Conference in Loveland. Um, Dr. Matt's a keynote. We're super excited Yay! about it. <laughs> So, so folks, thank you again for coming and you have, you've gotten some thank yous here in the, um, 
in the uh, comments here, Dr. Matt, thank you from, from several people who just, who appreciated your talk tonight. So. It was my great pleasure. I love working with you guys. And yes, I mean, nine months will be here before we know it, but you know, if you need anything from me between now and then, please don't hesitate to reach out. All right. And Colorado folks, if you're uh, bearing down for the storm, like I am here in Northeast Colorado, uh, stay safe, stay home, stay warm, be careful out there. For those of you who aren't in Colorado or aren't going to get 13 inches of snow in the next 12 hours, enjoy your balmy winter weather. <laughs> <laughs> We're not mad at all. <laughs> all right, folks, have a great evening. Bye, everyone.